Hey, Ohio. <laughs> Columbus, it's really good to be here. Um, I need to do this. Oh, H. See, I'm not from here, but I think that's just a cool thing to do. So, uh, so I'm Derek Weeks. I work at Sonotype. I'm also co-founder of All Day DevOps, and uh, I have a treat for you before lunch today. So uh, I'm glad that you're all here to uh, chat about uh, some research I've been doing for the last six years. So any organization's journey, any of your organization's journeys to excellence begins when you cease to sacrifice quality for velocity, for speed. Right, but record scratch. Uh, Nicole Forsgren and David earlier this morning just told us like velocity is extremely important. Right, every year in the state of DevOps report, we're told that the peak performers out there are deploying 200 times faster, their change failure rates are seven times lower, uh, their uh, mean time to respond to incidents is 2,600 times faster, they are 1.7 times more likely to use, extensively use open source in their environment, and in fact, they're one and a half times more likely to want to expand their use of open source through, uh, through their environments. So, uh, speed is a good thing, and speed and open source have helped us become extremely efficient within our organizations. It's, ex it's helped us develop software faster and release software faster, and the use of open source within software development practices is what led to an intersection of the research I've been doing for the last few years with Gene Kim and Dr. Stephen McGill and a host of other security and data researchers, data scientists uh, throughout the past year. So we spent 10 months uh, collecting data, analyzing data about how software development teams are working. And part of what we wanted to understand within this uh, research comes from the Phoenix Project and the first way of DevOps within the Phoenix Project. That is, you have to understand the performance of the end-to-end -end system, and also as part of the first way of DevOps, never pass a known defect downstream. In order to better understand the use of open source in software development, what we wanted to do through our research is understand how software supply chains were utilized and different parts of those software supply chains were utilized. All of you in every single one of your organizations, you have a software supply chain that is fully in effect. You have suppliers, there are warehouses, there are manufacturing lines or development lines and there are finished goods. Right? You rely on open source projects for parts that you put into software. You get those parts from internet-based warehouses like Maven Central, NPM, the PyPy repo, the NuGet gallery, and you consume those into your software development practices to produce your finished goods at the end of the day. For the research that we undertook this past year, we looked at 36,000 open source projects uh, intensively to understand how they performed. We looked at over 30 million open source releases over the last 10 years to better understand those components and attributes associated with them. We looked at 12,000 software development organizations and surveyed over 6,000 developers on how they use open source in development. And we also examined over 68,000 applications built with open source components. And I'm going to share some of what we found out through that journey today with you. To get a sense of how much open source is being used out there, I'm going to share some stats with you. In Maven Central, this is where anyone that is a Java developer is going to get their Java open source components. There are 10 million Java developers on the planet. Last year, they requested 146 billion downloads from Maven Central. If you are a JavaScript developer, you are helping the 6.5 million Java develop, JavaScript developers worldwide download 11 billion JavaScript packages every week. 
the average JavaScript developer is downloading 66,000 packages a year. So what does this mean? Well, for one thing, it means we're being really efficient, right? Because why would you spend an hour, a couple of hours, a couple of days, a couple of weeks writing something from scratch when it's literally available from the internet to download in a second for free? Right? We all know this, and that's why we download these components. And these components allow us to develop our applications a lot faster. They improve the quality of the applications that we develop, and they make up about 85 to, in some places, 98% of the applications that are being built, the other parts being the custom code that you write to glue all of these components together. So in, when I looked at 12,000 software development organizations just in the perspective of Java components that they were consuming. Last year, the average organization consumed 313,000 Java open source components. They did this by relying on over 2,700 open source projects within the, the Java community. And within those, over 8,000 individual component releases across that population. You are effectively relying, if you think about this in a supply chain context, you have over 2,700 external suppliers of software that you are relying upon to build 85% of that application that you're now producing. So, what we understood, and we have understood for years, within the Dora reports and the State of DevOps reports, is that faster is better in the enterprise. The enterprises that are, you know, the elite DevOps performers have higher market share, they're more profitable, they have happier employees, right? But we wanted to figure out, is faster better within the open source community? within the suppliers that we're all relying upon to help build our software faster. So who is a really good supplier and how do we quantify that choice for our organization for the external suppliers that, that we're relying upon? So in order to do this, you know, comparing enterprises with open source projects, there are, you know, there are similarities, but there are also uh, differences within those. So of course you have multiple deploys a day, a week, a month, as we uh, learned earlier in David's presentation, uh, but you have version releases within open source. You have consistent development teams and you're fairly well resourced, or at least predictably resourced in the enterprise. On the open source side, it's not as predictable. Development teams are a lot more fluid within the open source community, depending on any of you that are contributing, how much time you have, how much you want to contribute to these programs uh, and projects overall. But there are some similar metrics that, that we can look at. What is the deployment frequency within enterprises? How do we relate that to open source projects and the release frequency? Uh, the organizational performance, is this a good organization, a profitable organization, a money-making organization? In open source, it really kind of falls down to popularity. How popular is this project? And the more popular it is, uh, supposedly the more successful that project is over time. We also have mean time to respond or mean time to remediate incidents that come up. And within open source projects, we have the time to remediate vulnerabilities or time to update your projects in general. So in the research, we wanted to first uh, look at how open source projects performed from a release frequency and popularity perspective. In order to do this, we needed a study uh, set to analyze or a data set to analyze. So again, we looked at the uh, Java open source uh, components mainly because I work at Sonatype. Sonatype is uh, part of its uh, non-commercial side of its business. We run Maven Central. So we have access to all the data to do the research on the suppliers and uh, the components that are there. So we were able to deep dive into this. But we looked at overall 260,000 projects. But we needed some similarities and commonalities among this data set. So we wanted to look at projects that had had multiple releases over a five-year period. 
projects that followed a standard versioning process, projects that had multiple dependencies that they relied upon uh, and updated uh, those over time. And we came down to a group of 36,000 open source projects that met these criteria that we could then evaluate. We also looked at the open source projects as your suppliers uh, based on a number of different attributes from the popularity, which was their average download count, uh, the size of the development teams, which we could often get from uh, GitHub and other sources, uh, development speed, release of continuous integration, release speeds, update times, et cetera, to figure out a lot of different performance attributes or behavioral attributes of these projects uh, that we're all relying upon. So the first hypothesis that we entered the research with was open uh, projects that release more frequently have better outcomes. And this was actually true. We validated this within, uh, within the research. These groups were five times more popular, so more people were downloading them if they were releasing more frequently. They had larger sets of developers, which is also uh, good. The more developers, the better resource, the more consistently they could uh, uh, update frequently. And they also had a greater rate of foundational support within, uh, within their practices. So the next and more complicated part of doing this analysis was figuring out the mean time to update and the mean time to remediate for uh, these projects when they had problems or when there were uh, issues or just how frequently they were releasing uh, in general. This is important because, you know, again, if we look at this from a supply chain context, from a manufacturing context, there are similarities that we can pull from decades ago uh, where W. Edwards Deming was advising auto manufacturers like Toyota and Mitsubishi, Ford and others to identify and fix defects early within the manufacturing process because it was a lot cheaper to do it there but also to rely on a set of suppliers that was uh, not just any suppliers out in the market, but the fewest and best suppliers. And to use the, not only to use the fewest and best suppliers, but to use the absolute best parts available from those suppliers. So the rules, if you look at those kind of rules in terms of quality, um, performance of your suppliers, what we are able to do is look at three particular metrics from the open source community in these projects. And that was time to remediate when there was a vulnerability, time to update in general, so how frequently are they releasing, and then stale dependencies. Are they leaving any dependency updates uh, behind as they go through? So to understand the kind of analysis that we had to go through, there's, uh, I'm going to walk through a very simple model with you that's a core component and two dependencies. Now, some projects, of course, have a lot more dependencies, but just to give you a sense of what we walked through. So in this case, we have uh, component C, 2.2, and it has two dependencies, B, 2.2, and A, 2.2. And what we wanted to figure out is what happens and what is the timing of what happens between 2.2 and 2.3 releasing for C. Well, as it turns out, on occasion, a component or a dependency has a vulnerability discovered in it. That vulnerability uh, is discovered in 2.2, B2.2, but it has to rely on the open source project to update that uh, component, remove the vulnerability, or fix the vulnerability, and release a new version. During that time that B is vulnerable, because C also relies on it, C is vulnerable. So we, have the, we wanted to calculate the vulnerable time for C. And we also looked at if B updated, then the time to, for C, 2.3, to incorporate to B, 2.3, was the remediation time, as well as the update time for these uh, components. We also needed to look at other dependencies that were in place. So uh, A, 2.4, being incorporated to C, 2.3, is the update time for A. But you, sorry, you also see A2.3 was never incorporated into the project. So we wanted to see what was the update time, what was the remediation time, and were there any stale dependencies being left, and if so, how often were those stale dependencies left or not incorporated in. So here's what we found when looking at 
open source projects that had known security vulnerabilities. So a vulnerability, this is not unknown, so these are known security vulnerabilities announced, they have CVEs. Um, did the project update those dependencies or the um, uh, core component with the vulnerability? So the median time to update for any of these 36,000 projects was 180 days. The mean time to update was almost a year. So if a vulnerability was discovered, it takes on average a year to update it, which means if there's a vulnerability in a project that you're using or with a supplier that you're using, on average, that supplier is taking a year to create the fix, to deliver the fix, and then it takes longer for you to take that fix and put it into your environment. And then there's uh, the 95th percentile, well, at least these organizations or projects did update their uh, components for vulnerabilities, but they, uh, they took three and a half years to do it. There are other projects that have never remediated and therefore are not on the chart. But there were some strong performers here, right? So what we want to figure out is, and, and as we've said before, you don't want to just rely on any supplier or any open source project. You want to rely on the best. So when a project had a known vulnerability, could they update quickly? So the top 20% of these organizations were updating you know, anywhere between 50 or within 100 days. They are releasing a new version that has the vulnerability fix uh, within it. But not all open source projects have a known vulnerability ever within, uh, within them. Some just go without uh, vulnerability. So we wanted to figure out how does the mean time to remediate or median time to remediate compare to the median time to update? And so this is, if these uh, organizations are updating quickly, right, then projects that, uh, or projects that are remediating quickly, what we found out was those projects or projects in general update frequently. And the projects that update frequently are also staying more secure as a consequence of updating frequently. So the blue line remains the same. That is the mean time to remediate security vulnerabilities. If we look at whether they have security vulnerabilities or not, are they updating their dependencies over time? And what we see is there's a high correlation between those that are updating frequently and those that are uh, maintaining higher levels of security. Now, this is obvious and logical to anyone that understands known vulnerabilities. If a component just came out in the market, there's been less, uh, fewer eyeballs on it and therefore less time to discover known vulnerabilities in it. So if you're using more current versions, you're likely to stay safer. Uh, but we did see this high correlation. So we wanted to figure out in this group as well, were there any other attributes of suppliers other than update frequency that any of us could rely on to make better supplier uh, choices in time. But this, before I uh, get to that, the hypothesis two that we entered with was projects that update their dependencies more frequently would stay more secure. So the data did validate that. We did see that that was true, obviously from the, the charts that, that we just showed. Now, the hypothesis, hypothesis three, and I'm not gonna go through all the hypotheses from the study here, just a couple um, to highlight the findings that we had, but we wanted to, to see if projects with fewer dependencies would actually uh, stay more up to date. So if you're a project and you only have two dependencies, it's gonna be a lot easier in that model that I showed you previously with components A, B, and C to update than if you had 17 or 20 or 40 dependencies on the open source project, right? So that's totally logical. Two is easier to update than 17. And it's not true uh, based upon the data. So uh, projects with fewer dependencies actually had a worse time to update. Projects with more dependencies had better times to update. And what we saw here was that larger uh, development teams had faster times to update and they released more frequently. And we're seeing here on the chart the size of the development team from top to bottom. So the teams are getting bigger as you go uh, up the, the chart. As you go from left to right, the further right you are, the more dependencies you have. So as teams grew in size, they actually had more dependencies that they were relying upon, and the larger teams were actually updating their dependencies more. 
So there's a high correlation between the size of the development team and the number of dependencies they had. We don't know the causation of if more developers are bringing more dependencies to the open source project um, or, if, uh, or if more dependencies requires more developers. Uh, the, we didn't look at that within the, the study. Uh, but what we certainly found was that two pizza teams are a heck of a lot more productive than one pizza team uh, because you can feed about six developers, four to six developers with two pizzas, uh, and they have more dependencies. They're updating faster uh, and releasing more frequently as, uh, as projects. So this is my favorite hypothesis from the, the study. So projects that... Uh, Projects that are more popular are more able to stay up to date within, uh, within, their, um, uh, within their practices. So the reason that this is important was we all rely on popularity for our choices of uh, open source components. And we all read back in 1999, the Cathedral and the Bazaar, when Eric S. Raymond said, with more eyeballs, all bugs are shallow. Right? So in open source in 99, uh, back when he wrote this, open source was this evil monster that was competing against proprietary software and it was, you, know, you shouldn't use open source because it's dangerous and it's not secure. And you know, the, um, in this book, Eric S. Raymond introduced Linus's law with more eyeballs, all bugs are shallow, and therefore more people working on this and more eyeballs will make uh, these components uh, and open source more secure but we found out that wasn't necessarily true, that not all projects that are popular are actually good at staying up to date or good at staying uh, more secure. So as part of the study, when we were looking at this, we started to understand um, different clusters of behavior within, uh, within the study. So part of this ends up that we have exemplar groups, both small and large. They were the ones with the small groups had one and a half to two developers. The large groups had between eight and nine developers on average. They were staying up to date frequently. They were staying more secure as a consequence of staying up more up to date. The laggards had poor mean times to update, so they were the folks at three and a half years updating things. Lots of stale dependency counts. Um, the features first folks were releasing new updates frequently but they weren't fixing uh, security vulnerabilities as a uh, result, so they had um, poor, times to, um, poor times to update vulnerabilities. And then the cautious kind of, they updated at an okay rate, but they were never really uh, uh, good at staying on the latest version of their, uh, of their dependencies overall. So here's the, like, this is one of my favorite charts from the, the report. So the, the easiest way to read this is the large uh, exemplars and the small exemplars are the green and blue dots within this chart. And what we read here is the release frequency from left to right. So the further left you are in this chart, the faster you are at releasing. How many days does it take you to get uh, a release? On uh, the y-axis here, the higher you are, the more popular you are as an open source project. And so we found this cluster of behavior of the, the exemplars were actually releasing more frequently, and whether they were a small team or a large team, and they were more popular as a result of releasing more frequently, staying up to date, delivering more features. So if you wanted to pick suppliers based upon some kind of attributes, yes, you want popularity, but you want these organizations releasing frequently, you want them staffed well uh, from a development team perspective, and what you don't want to rely upon is this group, because this group is popular, but they're not very good at updating. They're not very good at releasing frequently. So if we go over here, these organizations are at 100 days. These organizations are at a year to give any kind of update. So it, it, we, what we were seeing was that more popular organizations or the most popular projects weren't necessarily the best projects um, and that relying on popularity alone is an attribute for choosing your projects is not the only attribute uh, that you should rely upon. 
So as we were going through this research, the other question that we had all along is, I know how our suppliers are behaving and how frequently they're updating their dependencies and how frequently they have releases. And we know from the state of DevOps reports that higher performance teams have uh, higher update frequencies or release frequencies. But we went out and we surveyed 658 developers uh, back in May, and we asked them, what are your practices of updating dependencies? Do you have a program in place? Have you applied any automation to this? Is there a practice for removing uh, troublesome dependencies within uh, your environments? And quite honestly, I think we were all surprised by the data that came back. So we, uh, 652 people answered the survey. They answered every uh, question in the survey. Um, and I think this is kind of aspirational in terms of answers. Yes, we're applying some process and some automation uh, and some policy into what we're doing, um, but I, I kind of expected it to come back seven or eight percent of people were actually updating dependencies on a regular basis or had a practice in place to do so, but it was surprising nonetheless to see the survey data come back to say, yes, we have practices in place. And when we looked at, this is e even more important, when we looked at the data to, to understand the behaviors of the exemplars in these groups, so those that had a process in place to update the dependencies or, or scheduled updates, had a process in place, used some automation, they were 12 times more likely to use automation, 11 times more likely to have a process, 10 times more likely to schedule dependencies, but as a result, they were three times, the exemplars were 3.2 times less likely to consider updating dependencies as painful, and 2.6 times less likely to consider updating dependencies as painful, painful when there was a vulnerability. And what that told us was when you're climbing this mountain every day, it's easier. If you do this as a standard part of your practices, and you're doing this once every couple of months, really it's easy. If you're updating your dependencies once a year, once every other year, uh, updating to the latest versions, it's a trudge, right? If you climb a mountain once every other year, it's going to be hard. If you climb a mountain every day, it becomes easier, and your employees are happier. So similar to what we see in the State of DevOps report, more frequent deployments, happier employees, uh, higher job satisfaction, same way for dependency management. Now, we also, as I mentioned, looked at 68,000 applications overall to understand what components they were using. Now, what you see here is that half of the components being used were developed in the last three years. And this is important because when you look at the vulnerability rates in those components, the ones that were developed in 2017 or uh, newer have a 65% uh, lower vulnerability rate than older components. Half the components that you're using, 15% of those have known vulnerabilities. If you just use the newer, later versions of, the latest versions of components, you could drop your vulnerability uh, defect density by 65% uh, through this practice. Now, Jez Humble and Dave Farley, when they wrote Continuous Delivery, they didn't say go fast, and that's the only purpose of that book. In chapter one, they said, you have to build quality in, right? And as part of building quality in, how do you do that? When we surveyed um, 5,500 developers back in January, the elite DevOps teams, the blue here, were telling us tooling is informing them of security updates or security vulnerabilities within the code that they have. Not security tools, these are developers saying developer tools are helping me be, become more aware of this. When we ask about things like open source policies, do you have one in place or not? Those that didn't have a policy in place, uh, or, or those that uh, were non-DevOps practices, 25% um, followed their policy. When automation was present in the elite DevOps practices, they were 62% of the time had a process and followed it. When automation is there and present for developers, it's harder to ignore the policies and governance that happen around open source choices. And as a result in managed software supply chains, we can see a 55% reduction uh, in the um, uh, visibility or um, presence of known security vulnerabilities within these open source components. 
So by getting this information, the core purpose of this information throughout the study was to understand if we're relying on so many of these suppliers, how do we make better choices? And how do we make better choices at the speed of development by applying these attributes? So there's no solutions on the market that actually apply any of this data that we found in the research this past year. But it allows us, now that we have data, to actually start thinking about how can we build this into our development and DevOps practices to make better choices on the 2,400 suppliers that we're relying upon. Right? So imagine if we could have an automated rating system for open source projects where you understood who's a two-star supplier within the ecosystem. Maybe even if they're super popular, they have other attributes that don't make them as highly rated as the five-star projects within the community. As mentioned in an earlier presentation about, um, you know, imagine that machines are making software. Imagine machines are coding. Right? And machines are assembling application. If 85% of what you're building or 95% of what you're building is coming from pre-assembled parts, machines can learn pretty easily what are the best parts to use and how do I put these together from the best suppliers and keep them up to date. Now, none of you as developers are out of a job because of this kind of data. Your kids, uh, your choice. So our journey together as an organization, as a community, begins when we cease to sacrifice quality for speed. Hopefully this information you found helpful, insightful. Hopefully it will spark a discussion in your own organization. For any of you that want a copy of the slides, the surveys, the state of the software supply chain report that Gene, myself, Dr. Stephen McGill published back in July, very simple, my out of office uh, email is on for today. Uh, if you email me at weeks at sonotype.com, you don't need to put a subject line or anything, it just sends my auto reply email. It has the links on SlideShare where the documents and the slides are located. You don't have to register to download them. Because this is being recorded, if you are watching this after this conference and you email me, my out of office message is not on. Please say, I watched your DevOps Days Columbus presentation. I'd like the slides and not just email me some blank thing with no subject line from who knows where, uh, which I do get on occasion. And then I have to guess who is this person and what did they want and which conference presentation was I at. So uh, that is all I have. And we're going to wrap up. But thank you very much.